Get to the next item on the agenda, Mr. Derek Owens, number 20-1009. And that would be Mike Johnson. He's going to really multitask now. <laughs> By the way, Mr. Johnson has been doing all the presentations today, I believe. No, from home. He's been doing some stuff from home. We've got Allison Lay inside the facility uh, doing the multitasking. So everything that you have seen today has been put on by two individuals in different locations, and I think they deserve a, a certainly a round of applause when we're over with for doing a great job. So with that, Mr. Johnson, if you would proceed. Oh, thank you very much, sir. I appreciate that. Um, Mr. Derek Owens is requesting authorization to install a five foot wide by 148 foot long open pile private pier with a 10 foot by 12 foot deck. And that's gonna be attached to an existing uh, permitted boathouse structure along Free, House, Free School Creek at 442 Schoolhouse Road in Gloucester County. The project is protested by an adjacent property owner. Um, in the slide, you can see the project area highlighted in yellow. Um, this project is located at the mouth of Free School Creek, and this is a tributary to the Severn River in Mob Jack Bay in Gloucester County. Here's a look at the project area. Again, the uh, proposed work area highlighted by the yellow marker. Um, and the protestant, uh, Ms. Ann Rex, owns the property circ circled in red, which is off to the northeast. Uh, here's the closer project area. Uh, please note that the boathouse you see here was authorized to be replaced by the commission at its May 2018 meeting. The authorized boathouse is a double slip enclosed boathouse with exterior deck space. The aerial you see here shows the original boathouse and the replacement has not been completed yet. The boathouse is permitted to be reconstructed in its original footprint and the proposed pier will also be in the same footprint you see in this photo. The applicant wants to replace the pier as it was accidentally removed by the contractor when they started work on the boathouse. It was not proposed to be replaced in the application for the boathouse and the justification for the pier replacement is to more sailboat owned by the applicant. There's a second pier on the property on the south facing shoreline, um, right about here. Um, this pier in its current configuration meets the exemption requirements in the Code of Virginia, and staff has discussed having this pier enlarged to accommodate the applicant's needs for mooring a, mooring a sailboat. But due to the fetch and the proposed location for the pier is also protected by the rock sill in this area here, the applicant would rather replace the pier that he had. Staff also notes that there is a seagrass bed offshore south facing shoreline, and it would be preferable from an environmental perspective to build the area, build a pier in the area proposed as the as a pier on the south facing area would shed you know, some seagrass in that area. Um, starting to get into the project drawings uh, supplied by the, uh, the agent for the applicant. This is simply showing the property, you know, of approximate property boundaries of the applicant, Mr. Owens, and the uh, protestant, Ms. Rex, here off to the northeast. And a view drawing showing the location of the 148 foot long pier and 10 foot by 12 foot deck header. You can have some benchmarks from the, from the existing house. Pier would extend again well feet with a 12 foot by 10 foot section, so approximately 168, 100 foot long pier. Uh, here's a plan I'm showing the previously authorized boathouse dimensions and the proposed pier, 140 long pier and 10 foot by 12 foot deck. This is cross-sectional on the water depths along the pier. You can see at the end of the pier, out here where the pier head is located, we have about minus six feet mean low water, which would facilitate the mooring of the sailboat. Finally, we have a benchmark showing the distance from the rock sill, showing there will be no impact of navigation between the, between the pier and the uh, rock sill as well. Now we're getting into some ground shots. Um, you can see that the old, the old boathouse and pier have been removed, and they have started construction on the uh, authorized boathouse. Um, they have ceased construction for the moment, trying, waiting for the uh, permits for this pier to come through. The new pier would be located on the left side of this 
boathouse extending out to some pilings out here that you'll have a better view of in a minute. The angle showing the, the deck face in the, in the uh, boathouse pilings that have been driven. And another angle, or another, just turning to the right a little bit, you can see the end of the boathouse here. The pilings you see out here in the water were actually left over from the original pier, and that just so they could get the alignment correct on the new pier. And this would be the channel word terminus out here of the new pier as well. Um, just so you can kind of see what used to exist there, here's a ground shot of the old pier and boathouse. The uh, pier coming out to the small deck out here, you can see extending off to the left. Uh, this is just the other side of the boathouse looking upstream. You can see that there are a number of other piers and even another semi-enclosed boathouse up, up here to the right. Uh, this is a list of vessel and documentation provided by the applicant, Mr. Owens, in their joint permit application. You can see here they have listed a 27-foot uh, Catalina. And they, and they approximate the draft at approximately six feet. So we can see why they're trying to ask for the pier to go out as far as they do. Uh, BMRC has received a number of letters of protest from Ms. Rex. Her first is in your packets, but the one I have exhibited here um, was uh, received by BMRC on Friday and too late to include in your packets. If, you're, if you would like to, I can certainly read this into the record at the commission's request, but I will be glad just to leave this up if you read it as well. In her first letter, Ms. Rex cites concerns with increased boat traffic to the installation of the pier, which may be causing erosion on her property, other environmental impacts, and the potential commercial use of the pier. In her second letter here, she also states that it would be more preferable to extend the existing pier on the south side of the property. As I stated earlier, this was rejected by the applicant as that area received higher wave energy, and he already had a pier that he did not want removed, protected by the spit. Also, staff feels the proposed location is preferable to the presence of the seagrass on the south-facing shoreline that will be shaded by any new pier construction. Staff is sensitive to Mrs. Rex's concerns about the pier and her wishes to have a quiescent water view from her property. However, staff admits the pier before it was removed had existed at this location and in the configuration proposed since 1962. Therefore, the replacement of the pier will not increase the impact of her view shed from previous conditions. Ms. Rex also cites concerns with commercial use of the pier. The pier and boathouse are being permitted for private use only. Any sale or rental of mooring space by the owner would be a violation and subject to commission enforcement action. The issue raised by Ms. Rex of shoreline erosion is a concern of all waterfront owners, and boat traffic does contribute to it. However, this creek already has a number of piers and associated vessels, and free navigation along the waterways of Virginia is a right enjoyed by all citizens of, the, of Virginia. Therefore, this is a known hazard of purchasing waterfront property. Accordingly, after evaluating merits of the project against the concerns expressed by those in opposition to the project, and after considering all the factors contained in 28.2-1205 of the Code of Virginia, staff recommends the approval of the project as proposed. Um, the applicant, Mr. Owens, is represented by Laura Morgan, who works for R&W Marine, and Ms. Rex does plan to uh, address the commission as well with her concerns for the project. I'll be glad to answer any questions you have at this time. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Any questions of members of the commission by Mr. for Mr. Johnson? Hearing none, uh, Ms. Laura Morgan, agent for the applicant, are you on board? Laura Morgan? If you're on, please make sure you unmute yourself on your computer. Uh, Commissioner Bowman, uh, this is Derek Owens. I'm on the line, and I top of, of my request for the p permit for a peer replacement. You, you broke up, sir. I could not hear you. Commissioner Bowman, my name is Derek Owens, so I am on the line, and I can speak on behalf of the of the permit application. All right, sir. Do you solemnly swear the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you, God? I do, sir. Proceed, please, sir. So yes, sir. Mike has Mike has stated everything correctly and, and did a great job with the picture packet that he put in place. Um, Ms. Rex has protested um, the replacement of the pier, which uh, would be identical to what was already there. Um, my contractors took out that pier by accident as they were demolishing the boathouse. They were supposed to leave from the boathouse, 
out to the channel word side of the of the pier in place, uh, but uh, they didn't do that. So that when they took everything out, then I've got nothing left, and actually no way to get to the boathouse now at all. Um, that is being constructed, and Mike's right, construction's been halted until we can get um, a permit to replace the pier that was taken out by the contractors. Um, so with that, Ms. Ms. Rex did request that um, we build a pier on the river side of the property, uh, and Mike addressed those concerns. The only additional thing I would say is that a pier um, to get to water depth to more sailboat would go all the way out to the channel on the river side and that would be an obstruction to boating traffic coming in and out of the creek if we were to uh, consider putting a pier on that side of the property. So this was the this was the, the best spot for all parties involved and you know I respectfully ask the commission to consider my request. Thank you. Thank you sir. Any questions for uh, for Mr. Owens by member of the members of the commission? Okay, they're seeing none. Is anyone else in support of this application? Is anyone, anyone here that wishes to speak in opposition to this application? I see Ms. Ann Rex is listed as a protestant. Ms. Rex, are you there? I am here. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Do you solemnly swear the testimony that you give today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So, help you guys? I do. Could you proceed, please, ma'am? Okay, first of all, I'd like to thank the board and the commissioners for the um, for their patience in advance. I have not, I don't have a lawyer as do our um, exalted engineers. Um, so I'm having to plead my own case. And in that respect, I invite you to make any kind of question, you know, question me, clarify, et cetera. Um, my first question is to Mike Johnson. Ma'am, ma that's, yes. that's, at this point, we would like for you to give your presentation okay. to the commission, then if you have any questions, I can then refer them to Mr. Johnson. But in this situation, I don't believe it appropriate that, that you, that you cross okay. the Mr. Johnson okay. at this time. I, I'm having trouble understanding the flow of everything. Okay. So basically I am objecting to the Owens request to install a 185, 80, 180 by five foot pier and 10 by 12 foot pier head beside a 68 by 37 foot closed boathouse that has a 37 foot by 10 foot deck. Um, this boathouse is currently under construction. Um, my first question is why is a, is a pier of this magnitude needed in a residential setting on a small creek? Um, Mr. Owens just said, and this was the first I le learned of this, that he ha is going to have a sailboat. At the hearing to approve the boathouse, um, he said he was going, he needed a large boathouse like that because he was going to have a huge sail, a huge regular boat, motor boat that would then fit in the boathouse. However, the boathouse is now outfitted with two boat lifts that would accommodate much smaller boats. So I'm, I'm wondering about um, the real necessity for having a pier. I mean, surely if he wants to have a pier, I think it's a great idea. I think he should put it, however, where he currently has a pier already. And you can see in exhibit one, do the, um, do you members have copies? I guess you're looking at these on a the screen. Is that right? Yes, okay. Yes, ma'am, we are. All right, so exhibit one is that first picture. Um, it's a dock that exists right in front of his house on the river side of the property. Um, it's not currently 148 feet, but it could be 148 feet. Uh, question is, why would he need 148 feet? This is a residential area. It's a residential creek. Uh, this is not a commercial entity. Um, so if he's afraid that enlarging that pier will take it too far out in the water, you know, a 50 foot pier, a 60, 60 foot pier, that's plenty of pier, I would think, for most people in our creek. And in fact, there are no piers that are that length already in the creek. Um, so my first question is, why is a pier of this magnitude needed? Um, 
as it suggested, the creek would, would bring another 860 square feet of um, construction on, onto Free School Creek, 860 more square feet. And the boathouse alone has brought um, 3,000 and some square feet of construction into the creek. Um, so I would suggest that he could expand the existing pier, that he does not necessarily, I don't see any reason he would need 148 feet. Um, and that would shelter the wildlife on the creek side, as well as my property from pollution, noise, and erosion. And I, um, the boathouse, if you look at the second picture, the boathouse under construction now has these two long piers, each of which measures 68 feet, the length of the boathouse. Um, that is plenty of dock space for just about anyone, it would seem. And it seems more than adequate for residential use. Um, if I were to request a boathouse this size and a dock this size today, as a new, a new construction, I think I would, you know, clearly, I would have to give a lot of substantiation for why that was needed. When, when VMRC approved the boathouse, I asked if they were guided by the principle of grandfathering in old structures. And Mr. Bowman said no, that the grandfathering principle was not the major principle guiding decisions. However, the board then voted to grandfather in the structure, structure. anyway. In fact, they, it, they made it bigger because prior to this, the deck on the back of the old boathouse was much smaller. It was, let me see, the deck on the old boathouse. While you're looking up that, ma'am, I think the bottom line is that uh, the word grandfather is a matter of semantics. Uh, we look at each individual case on its individual merits. And if a boathouse ends up in the same footprint, that does not necessarily mean it's grandfather. Grandfather and I'm not a lawyer means that by right, you have the authority to place a structure back in the same place it was of the same size and same similar structures and characteristics. We do not grandfather uh, boat houses or any other structures. They're all uh, judged on the individual merits. So I just wanna make clear of that. So I guess it's just coincidental that you approved then <clears throat> a boat house that conformed to one that was there before. Uh, Ma'am, I, I would not say, and I'm not gonna get in a debate with you on that, on our decision, decisions been made, but I would not call anything that we do coincidental. I would call it a thoughtful debate amongst nine members of the, of the Marine Resources Commission appointed by the honorable governors that have seen fit to have these fine people on there. Uh, that's, why, that's what I would call it, not coincidental. house and um, by approving a 37 foot wide by 10 foot deck on the back um, that was larger than what was there before before was a 16 foot a five foot weight it was not 37 feet wide the deck that it replaced was not 37 feet wide but my point is that is a lot that is a the impact of that structure on our little creek is not necessarily a good thing. It brings in erosion, pollution, more boats, et cetera. Um, the mission state for the Virginia Resource Marine Commission, at least part of it, as it's stated on your website, says that you serve as stewards of the Commonwealth's marine and aquatic resources, and that you protect its tidal waters and homelands for present and future generations. I appeal to VRMC to consider this second guiding principle as they evaluate this request. After all, if VMRC currently re allows people to rebuild everything that was there before, it seems to me that it's negating its core reason for existence. Every structure built in a fragile creek setting has consequences. And one such consequence, and I'd like to show, um, Picture exhibit number four, picture number four right now. 
Um, not that one. There should be not, not those. Now, exhibit four shows the erosion on my property. Ah, right here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so one consequence of changing structures and our, our building structures of huge size on a small creek and putting in living shorelines um, is increased erosion at neighboring properties. So these pictures show the increased erosion at the head of the peninsula where my property lies. In the past three years, Mr. Owens has built up a rock sill, a living shoreline to unprecedented heights. It's an enormous crescent and it has changed how the tides enter and travel through our little creek from the Severn River. The head of the peninsula of my property, which uh, in, his, in the drawings that Mike Johnson submitted, you can see that my property is shaped like a peninsula. The head of the peninsula of my property has eroded significantly in just three years. At least four feet of shoreline has disappeared. Shoreline trees are falling as they succumb to increased wave action, undercutting their roots when daily tides enter the creek. I've lived here for 20 years and I expect some change coastline. I mean, I've heard about global warming and subsidence, et cetera. But in the first 16 years, we had very minimal change, if any. However, in the last four years, since the rock sill was built up to supersize, built up, you know, nourished, I was told it's been nourished, um, the amount of erosion of my property and trees, and you can see here, the undercutting from the tides um, has been affected. Maybe the supersized rock sill provides additional protection to Mr. Owen's property because his home was flooded during Hurricane Isabel, but it adversely affects mine. Adding 100 and effectively 160 feet of pier to the creek would attract boats and increase traffic to the mix and would cause more erosion, more pollution and noise. Exhibit number three, if you could show that now, please. That's, that's number five. Exhibit, okay, this one. So this shows the proposed path of the 160 foot pier, as well as the boathouse under construction. The pier would come out all the way from um, the posts on the right to the three little posts on the left. So basically 160 feet out into the water from the shore. And when I say the footage, I'm factoring in the deck that, that is at the end, uh, or the pier head as you call it. Um, so these structures are commercial size structures, not residential size structures, and they exceed the size of any other boathouses, piers, et cetera, on our creek. Um, in the hearing to approve the 68 by 37 foot boathouse plus deck, a shared concern that Owens might be planning to operate a commercial enterprise from his home. His brother operates a soft shell crab business from a garage nearby just down the road. And this still concerns me. I know he says he's not going to have a commercial operation, but what recourse would I have if this 160 foot pier is filled with crab pots, jet skis, and increased boat activity. Ma'am, ma'am, it'd be real simple. If that thing is converted to a commercial entity in violation of the permit, the permit would be revoked and he would be before the commission. How would, how would that be adjudicated? Would I call you? How would that work? You could call me <laughs> or you could call the Virginia Marine Police, either one. The Virginia Marine, please. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so um, before the suggestion, the old pier that was there, um, Bob Lehman, the previous owner, lived in Manassas. He didn't live here. He docked his 50-foot sailboat on the old pier, 
because the mast was too tall for the boathouse. He lived full time in Manassas. And so having the, the long pier there did not affect the, the wildlife and tranquility in the, in the um, creek. A commercial business has never operated there. And um, I would not have bought my house if it had. So I hope that it's true that there is no commercial enterprise here, but you can understand, no commercial enterprise planned, but you can understand my concern. So as you decide the matter, uh, I think the solution is really quite simple. Approve, give him the one, if he wants a 160 foot pier, use the current one in front of his house that's on the big water preschool, I mean, the big water, the Severn River, not a dock in this creek on Free School Creek. The compromise then would satisfy everybody. The Owenses would get their 160 foot pier. It would just be on the river. VMRC would fulfill its mission as a steward and protector of the Commonwealth's tidal waters and homelands. And the inhabitants of Free School Creek would get some relief from encroaching pollution, erosion, and noise. Thank you, that, that is my position and I invite your questions and clarifications. There are a few other pictures. I'm sorry, could we go back to the pictures one moment? Um, this pic, wait, that picture. The picture you see here was taken in 2015 uh, when Bob Lehman owned the property. So this is the old boat house and this is the old pier. You'll notice there is no 10 by 12 foot pier head on this pier. And furthermore, if you could there, could you go back to the other picture, Mike, that shows, not that one, not that one. Let's see. Uh, this one, this picture, this. This is currently there lying in wait for the pier to be attached to. But those structures, when you look at this picture of the boathouse in 2015, those, uh, pilings are not there. There's this piling way out here, but the pilings that you see here were not there in 2015 before um, the changes were made to the property. Could we go back now to the um, pictures that show the sill? Okay, so this this is the, a picture of the sill coming out from um, from their property and making a huge crescent. And over here, you can see my gazebo, which was visible in the pictures that showed the erosion. And then back here, you can see my house. So what I want to point out here is that the tidal waters that come into the creek now that used to go straight back over the, the smaller cell used to go straight back, now are, are hitting right the peninsula, right there of my property, the apex of the peninsula and taking out trees under the shoreline, causing tons of erosion on my property. This is another close-up of the sill, and you can see that it's heftily, it's been nourished to a huge degree. Now, I'm not saying it's not pretty. What I'm saying is it's altering the way the water moves into the creek, and it's affecting the erosion on my property. And it's, I'm saying that well aware that global warming exists, that subsidence is happening. But for 20 years, there has been no major erosion all along here, all along my entire property until now. And it's right here where the waters that are diverted by this sill come directly into my property. So the sill exists, it's been built. The, the boathouse, you have said yes on the boathouse. I'm hoping that you can satisfy everybody and save my property by saying yes on the boathouse, but putting it on the river side of the property. That's where a, a boathouse that's that long, a footprint of 160 square feet or whatever, belongs on the big river, not on this little creek. And I thank you and I'm open for questions. Thank you, ma'am. Any, any questions uh, uh, directs by members of the commission?
Seeing none, is there anyone else in opposition to this matter? Hearing none, Mr. Owens, you have two minutes to wrap up if you'd like to respond to anything you've heard. Yes, sir. Thank you, Commissioner Bowman. Um, a couple of points here. <clears throat> Mr. Rex is, is making an argument that uh, is not related to the pier, but about the sill um, sure. that she's got in the photos. That was done many years before my wife and I bought the property, properly permitted. Uh, Ms. Rex has been given that information on when that work was done. My wife and I have done nothing to re-nourish the sill or change it in any way. In fact, nothing along any of the shoreline have we changed or altered in any way, including what Ms. Rex is showing in the photos. Um, the, the other point about the length of the pier, the length of the pier is just necessary to more, uh, we need water depth to more the sailboat. Um, so that's the, that's the, the reason for the length of the pier. Okay. Any questions or follow up for, uh, for Mr. Owens before it goes before the, com to the commission? Hearing none, the matters before the commission for discussion and action. Mr. James Mine, I move to approve staff recommendations. Motion made by Mr. Miner to approve staff recommendations. Is there a second? This is Dr. Neal, I'll second. Second by Dr. Neal. Further discussion? Mr. France. Mr. France. Mr. Tankard. Aye. Mr. Zedrin. Aye. Mr. France, back with you. Dr. Neal. Aye. Mr. Miner. Aye. Ms. Lusk. Aye. Ms. Everett. Aye. Chair votes aye. Mr. France. Allison, can you see the microphone button, whether it's open, closed, or what's going on? Um, so it looks like Mr. France is not showing up on the panelist list anymore. I had a call-in user come up and I did unmute them, um, but they did not comment, so I don't think that was Mr. France. Okay. All right. Regardless, the motion passes seven to zero uh, if Mr. France decides to vote. Oh no, well, We'll just disregard that, unless he says that he heard the vote and check in. But regardless, at this time, the motion passes seven to zero. Thank you very much. Also, we're, we're gonna take, a, I know it's getting late in the day, we're gonna take about a 10 minute break to give staff a benefit to, uh, to, uh, to have a break. And we will reconvene uh, promptly, promptly at quarter of three, 2.45, thank you. I'd like to reconvene the October 27, 2020 meeting of the Marine Resources Commission. Before I go to the next item, I have a question for Mr. France. We had a roll call vote on the Derek Owens case, 20-1009, the Boathouse case. Mr. France, are you with us? I think he is still gone. Um, he was having some power and internet issues, and he okay. may not be able to join us for the rest of the meeting. Okay, then for the record and for the official record, the count is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven yeas, no nays, one absent, uh, or two absent, okay? And it, it, it will show that on the, uh, on the, uh, the sheet that I turn in, so. Just want to make sure that we're good with that. Okay. 
Okay, next item on the agenda is uh, Ballard Brothers Fish and Oyster Company, number 20-0141. And that would be Mr. Ben Stagg. Mr. Stagg, I understand you may have a different evaluation based on some discussions or whatever, or yeah, I'll let you explain it, but things may be just a little different. Yes, sir. Uh, everybody hear me okay? We can, sir. Okay. Uh, yes, this is a, a joint permit application from Ballard Brothers Fish and Oyster Company Incorporated. Uh, the initial request was to place up to 1,050 floating oyster cages within an area of approximately 650 feet by 355 feet rectangle. This would be over their existing lease, uh, 13637, which is in Cherry Stone Creek in Northampton County. The request is protested by a nearby Highland property owner and, an, and the same person has the adjacent lease as well. Uh, my evaluation has changed quite a bit. So while you can follow along the first page and a half or so is the same. Uh, a lot of things have happened on this one in the last two or three days and uh, required some modification to the request. Um, but with that, I'll get started. Uh, we did receive this application back at the end of January of this year. We did subject it to our normal public interest review um, and we did receive a protest. Uh, we notified the adjacent property owners and we did see, receive one protest uh, from the owners of property that's in the name of Tidewater Realty and Security Corporation. Uh, next slide. So the uh, subject application is generally in the center of this slide. Uh, lease number 16733 is shown there in the uh, left center. Uh, Mill Creek, which we'll talk about quite a bit, is that small creek uh, that runs to the south of the lease. And the protestant's property is due east of that lease. Next slide. Uh, here's an aerial photo of the area with the Worcester County leases shown. The little marsh icon represents the approximate location of the float application. Uh, you can see the SAV area is also shown to the south. Again, the protestant's property is the property to the east and to the north of Mill Creek, which is the small creek where the SAV runs into. And you can see a leak goes up into the uh, upper part of Mill Creek. Next slide. So after doing the public interest review and notifying the adjacent property owners, uh, we did receive a letter of objection from Judith O. Switzton, uh, who was listed as the vice president of Tidewater Realty and Security Corporation back in March. In that letter, she noted the application appeared to reference an incorrect lease as the location of the project. Additionally, she indicated the belief that the project as proposed may interfere with navigation to and from Mill Creek, a tributary to Cherry Stone Creek. She also noted the area should remain in its current state for recreational use. Uh, further noted that floating cages uh, would create an eyesore to the immediately adjacent property owned by Title Security Realty and Security Corporation, and could also create odor issues. She noted that Title Realty and Security Corporation has been consistent in the past in objecting to similar activities in the creek. Subsequent to that, the applicant did submit some revised information to correct some of the errors in the original application. Uh, the original application, uh, which is shown here, uh, did not impact any SAV beds as proposed. Uh, staff also understands that the applicant in the interim since March or since February has been in contact with Dr. Dr. Catherine Fulton who is also a principal and owner of Tidewater Realty and Security Corporation property to the east concerning the proposal. We believe there's been ongoing negotiations between the applicant and Dr. Fulton, uh, which, we, which may have resulted in a revised uh, modification submitted in March that would move the application slightly to the west in an attempt to avoid impacts to Mill Creek. So in this picture, you can see the four corners depicted of the original application and then a centroid in the center. Uh, at the southeasternmost icon there is what 
what there is of a channel into Mill Creek. You can clearly see it's a slightly deeper area there, and that corner would be right at, right, that corner would be right at the edge of the, the uh, these somewhat minimal channel going in out of Mill Creek. Next slide. Uh, this is the other, this is the drawing that was also provided with the application, just depicting the uh, rectangular area of the original January proposal. Next slide. Uh, this is just the coordinate values of that same box. Next slide. Uh, these are the other drawings submitted, uh, typical layout for the proposed floating uh, aquaculture structures. They would be anchored on the ends with screw type anchors. And as you can see, it'd be up to uh, 15 rows. Um, and next slide. Uh, this is a typical of just uh, what the individual cages would look like. Um, again, tethered at each end with anchor, uh, screw anchors and floating uh, cages. Next slide. One more typical of the actual, uh, what the system would look like. Again, the cage of course is underwater, the float system on the top. Uh, these are designed so they could be sunk if necessary, if uh, needed for bad weather, uh, but typically they would float on the surface as you see here. Next slide. So the use of cages and floats, um, nets and for, and for shellfish propagation has resulted in increased public awareness concerning the use of public bottoms and highlighted the necessity for a comprehensive review of such requests related to aquaculture. Such requests in populated areas raise issues regarding public trust lands to include user conflicts, property values, aesthetics, navigation impacts, and suitable bottom types. Stewardship of public trust lands while weighing the public and private benefits versus detriments requires a multifaceted review of such permit requests. Staff does evaluate all protested applications on a case-by-case -case basis considering all comments received concerning the area under request. So the total footprint of the original request was 1,650 by 355 feet, which would have been approximately 13.26 acres. Now the revision uh, that was offered uh, in February, well in March, um, to address uh, the channel area is shown here. Uh, it, it was moved slightly to the west, uh, so that southeast corner again has now been moved uh, slightly further to the west and we shifted the whole box that way. Uh, they also made the dimensions slightly different, uh, now requesting an area of approximately 1,100 feet by 350 feet. Next slide. So this represents both the March modification request and at the very end on the eastern side, you can see a dashed line which represents the original uh, area that they requested, which was right on the edge of the channel as depicted in this drawing. So line AB or A1B1 is the revised uh, movement shifting it slightly to the west. Uh, next slide. This is again just the coordinate values of that revised area submitted in March. Next slide. Uh, this is a graphic representation of that same drawing that we created on our CAD maps with the map underlayment. Again, here you can see better the channel area going into Mill Creek. Uh, and in this drawing, it appears that the original submission would have actually put the corner kind of in the middle of the deepest area there. Um, this does shift that corner to, uh, to the edge of the channel. And then once you go north of that, it kind of deepens up in a wider area going through the area. In September, the applicants uh, sent an additional uh, drawing set of drawings to Dr. Fulton, uh, moving this area even further to the west, approximately 290 feet from the channel or from the original proposal from the eastern side. Staff was copied on this email 
but the uh, drawings were not officially submitted as a, as a modification request. We believe this was an attempt by the applicant to address Dr. Fulton's concerns in hopes that by moving the, the site slightly more to the west would, would alleviate her concerns. Uh, so this revised area would have been 350 feet by 910 feet and would be about 7.31 acres. This also represents a further reduction in the size of the original request and the number of floats was reduced down to 750. Dr. Fulton then contacted our office in October requesting some additional mapping information uh, and she was given actual maps of this area similar to this one and some other maps of the larger area. She requested that she get a map that showed the leases and all permitted aquaculture activity in the creek, which we did attempt to provide to her. Uh, we also received an additional email from her on October the 21st. Uh, that email is in your packet, and it's a good general summary of her position to include that there had been a meeting scheduled between BMRC, the Army Corps of Engineers, the applicant, and Dr. Fulton earlier this year. But that never occurred because of the COVID-19 pandemic. The meeting was canceled and she continued to have concerns about the accuracy of the application documents, concerns about navigation, not just Bill Creek, Curry Stone Creek in general, possible adverse impacts to existing oyster resources, and questioned why this couldn't be relocated within the creek at a better location, not so close to her property that might impact her access. Staff spoke again with Dr. Fulton on Monday of this week, further discussed this application and the location of other floating aquaculture apparatus within the creek. Additionally, mapping information was again provided to Dr. Fulton on the same date to include the map location of the September proposal. Go to the next slide, please. Next slide. So this is a, a representation of the 290 foot shift uh, that was presented to Dr. Fulton. We did see this in a by copy of an email. Next slide. This is a graphic representation of that same area on a map that was provided to Dr. Fulton. Next slide. And this was a map sent to Dr. Fulton, the most recent map. She, she questioned where all the other floating uh, permitted structures were. There is a permitted authorized floating uh, permit for the smaller rectangle you see there, which is north of the, the uh, most recent September modification proffered to Dr. Fulton. And there are floats on that uh, site uh, Dr. Fulton did send me pictures of those and wanted to know what was the permit number for that. I did give her that information. There seems to be an anomaly on our website that that particular permit does not show up when you load that map uh, and, and ask to see all the joint permit applications. Uh, still investigating why that has occurred. And in any event, we did provide her with that information. Um, again, after speaking to her, and providing this additional information. Uh, I did ask her uh, of the, all the modifications that have been proffered, uh, if the commission were to approve one, would this most recent one, which is further away from her property and further away from the channel out of Mill Creek, be preferable over any of the others? And she said yes, but she does continue to object to even this proposal. While the applicant has stated in the email to Dr. Fulton in September that this was their final proffer a modification and if not acceptable they would seek a permit and might uh, seek to lease the to uh, permit the area they originally requested um, they can speak to that issue when they speak um, it should be noted that this request also requires an Army Corps of Engineers permit and there was some confusion over the last uh, two months, it appears, as to whether the Army Corps had authorized this or not. I did speak to the Army um, Corps of Engineers representative within the last week, and the Corps has not per authorized this project yet. And further, they indicated that the original proposal 
And the initial March proposal, which just moved it slightly to the west, will, would likely not be acceptable uh, because of the channel in the Mill Creek. And that they preferred to see an alignment at least 100 feet west of that channel. This request, as you see on the screen, is 290 feet from the original proposal, or about 270 feet from the edge of the channel. Uh, the core representative also indicated that there had been a meeting set up, but it was canceled due to COVID, that he still wished to conduct an on-site meeting with both BMRC, the applicant, the protestants, um, and but he was stymied because they were not, his supervisors were not allowing field visits to be conducted still during the COVID-19. So it's, I don't know when that could be scheduled. So any, any approval by the commission today would still be subject to Army Corps of Engineers approval as well. Um, and that will leave up to the Corps. I think that's the final slide, next slide. So after careful review and consideration of the objections raised by the nearby property owner and the potential impacts of permitting this area for floating shellfish aquaculture, staff has concluded authorization of the most recently modified area as proffered to the protestant, but not yet officially submitted to the commission, appears appropriate and would potentially be acceptable by the Army Corps of Engineers. Accordingly, after considering all the factors of 28.2.1205A of the Code of Virginia, recommend approval of this most recently proffered uh, area, which would contain up to 750 float structures over state of subaqueous bottom lands, as shown in the, the uh, drawing in the PowerPoint presentation that was proffered to the protestant in September of this year, which was within lease number 13637 in Cherrystone Creek in Northampton County. Should the commission approve this drawing uh, submission, we would want drawings submitted to the commission confirming this is the alignment they're requesting so they can be attached to the permit. We'd also recommend a royalty, annual royalty, $1,592.50 for encroachment over 318,500 feet of subaqueous bottom lands at a rate of 0.05 cents a foot or half a cent per square foot. I'd be happy to answer any questions the commissioners may have. Thank you, Dan. Any questions for Mr. Stagg by members of the commission? Well, I guess my only observation would be that this has gone back and forth a number of times and there's been due diligence on, I think, all parts to try to come to some resolution on the matter, but uh, we never know until the end of the hearing, but I, I, it does appear that unlike some cases that we have where people just dig their feet in and, you know, one side says, go away, I'm going to do this. The other side says, go away, I'm going to do that. And I don't think this has been the case. So uh, before it's even over with, I applaud all involved to to make sure or to, to indicate um, my appreciation and trying to come to some resolution. So. Again, any questions of Mr. Stagg? Thank you, Ben. Applicant uh, present or represented uh, is Tim Rapine on board, or Rapine, I'm sorry. It's Commissioner, uh, this is Kim Husky, Terry Stone yes, Ms. Hus yes, Ms. Husky, will you be presenting? Yes, sir. Okay, will you do me a favor? Do you solemnly swear the testimony that you give today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Okay, proceed, please, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner, members of the commission. We support staff's recommendation to decrease the width of the application, but would at this time request an additional 150 linear feet inshore uh, over our existing lease. And that would be, sir, to compensate for the decrease in width as the site was moved to the west. Uh, we have made numerous attempts since March, as Mr. Stagg has stated, to compromise with the protestant and have been unsuccessful. 
Cherry Stone has been operating in this area for decades. We have a lot of experience in this creek and understand it better than anyone. We have selected this site very carefully with a lot of research and thought going into it. The application is bound by SAV to the southwest, Mill Creek Channel to the northeast, and deep water of Cherry Stone Creek to the north. This is literal, there is literally nowhere else this application could go. Um, as stated with navigation concerns, navigation will not be impeded by this modified application. The area is too shallow and power boats would not be operating in this area anyway. Kayakers are able to traverse inside of the floating cages if they wish to paddle, uh, if they do not wish to paddle 300 yards around them. Floating cages, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Stagg, would you put up slide number four of our pre presentation? Thank you. Um, as you can see, members of the commission, floating cages do not have to be considered an eyesore or ugly. As you can see from our picture, of a similar area with a similar view, um, they are not at all objectionable. So in closing, we, we say we support the staff recommendation with the addition of 150 linear feet inshore over our current lease. Thank you again for your time. I'd be happy to any, answer any questions at this time. Any questions by members of the commission for Ms. Husky? Okay. Um, I do have, just to make sure um, that I get it right in this day of Zoom and WebEx, I do have other two other people that are indicating support. One was Tim Rapine and others John Psalm III that signed up. I just want to make sure that if they want to speak, they're afforded an opportunity. If there is silence, I'll, I'll presume that uh, Ms. Husky has handled the matter and we will move along. Mr. Rapine or Mr. Psalm? All right. Yes. Hello. This is Tim Rapine. Yes, Mr. Rapine. Mr. Rapine, did you wish to speak? Uh, yes, I'd like to preserve my time for uh, rebuttal if necessary. Okay, that'll be fine. Um, just I'll, I will swear you in that time if need arises. Mr. Song? Okay. Is anyone else here in support of this application that wishes to be heard? Is there anyone in opposition that wishes to be heard? I haven't been informed that uh, a gentleman by the name of Reed Mayo, attorney, um, wishes to represent both Catherine Fulton and Judith Swiston. If I'm wrong, then I can get corrected. It won't be the first time for sure, but uh, is Mr. Reed Mayo on the phone? I am, Mr. Commissioner. Can you hear me? I can, Mr. Mayo. I'm not familiar with you. Are you an attorney uh, licensed to, to, uh, to practice in the Commonwealth of Virginia? I am, Mr. Okay, sir, I will not swear you. Please proceed. And I, I don't intend to give any evidence, just commentary on the materials previously presented to this commission. Um, and again, thank you for allowing me to speak. As, I, as you indicated, I represent um, the, the company that owns some adjacent property, Tidewater Realty and Security. And their concern all along has been about navigation and the navigability of uh, Mill Creek all the way out to uh, Cherry Stone Creek and then of course into the bay. So it's not just merely out of Mill Creek, but also the full ability to access the bay from that same area and their property. The Ballard's credit, as has been indicated, they have been working with uh, Tidewater. Tidewater has been working with them through the offices of Dr. Fulton to see if they can reach some sort of accommodation. Um, and unfortunately, because of COVID, a lot of information has not been available until very recently, as uh, Mr. Stagg indicated. One of the concerns Tidewater had was the presence or the creation of additional floating cages in relation to existing floating cages and whether that would in fact create navigational issues. Um, one of the slides, I think the penultimate slide that Mr. Stagg presented to the commission actually shows a pretty tight proximity of the proposed um, cage, floating cage area with an existing floating cage area. I suspect when that's examined a little more carefully, there's actually a little more distance in there, but that's the type of concern Tidewater had. 
the, um, as I understand the recommendation of Mr. Stagg and the uh, and BMRC, as supported by Ms. Husky, there's, uh, I'm going to refer to it as the third revision dated September of 2000, September 18, 2020 is the one that's currently under consideration. From Tidewater's perspective, that appears to be acceptable. And as Mr. Stagg indicated, there was to be a uh, sort of a site visit, if you will, with BMRC, Army Corps, the applicant, and, uh, and Dr. Fulton, so they could all get their heads together and make sure that this was this uh, process and this project was going to work. And unfortunately, that got canceled. So that's our only caveat is it looks like this um, revision three uh, proposal will work, solves all of Tidewater's concerns, but it doesn't know because it doesn't have that expertise. And as uh, Mr. Stagg mentioned, some of this material is provided only as recently as last Friday or Monday. So with that in mind, we reserve our objection, but we understand that Ballard needs to move forward. We don't wish to unduly impede their ability to get this uh, project moving. And so we'll just um, shut up and sit down at that point. All right, so well, let me ask you a question just to make sure that I have the process correct. Have you and you and your clients have seen the map that's proposed at this juncture or have not? We have. This was the uh, September 18, 2020, uh, what I referred to as revision three or the third rev. Unfortunately, it was sent, I think, to um, by email. It wasn't it wasn't mailed and it wasn't mailed to the president or the registered agent. So it actually was attached to an email that wasn't looked at more carefully until we got into October. So the short answer is yes, uh, Mr. Okay. Commissioner. We, we have Just, reviewed it. We've studied it as best we can determine it is acceptable. But again, we don't have the expertise and haven't had the ability to get smarter eyes on it than ours. All right, I, because that's that's what we have before us at the present time that we're looking at. I just want to make sure that uh, we weren't going to go down the road and approve something that was speculative in nature. Um, and one might argue that still it might be, but at the same time, we do have something on paper that uh, that the commission can make an informed decision uh, when they when they cast their vote. So that was just my my major concern, Mr. Mayo. But uh, I thank you, um, Mr. Mayo. Do either one of your um, clients wish to speak, or is that uh, is that uh, is that it for the objection on behalf of the protestants? No, Mr. Commissioner, that is, that is it on behalf of the protest. All right, thank you very much. Is there anyone else in opposition to this project that wishes to be heard? Well, after a contentious day, this matter goes before the commission. So, matters before the commission for discussion and action. Zedrin, I move we approve staff recommendation. Motion made by Mr. Zedrin to approve staff recommendations. Is there a second? So moved, Ed Tankard. Second by Mr. Tankard. Any further discussion on the motion? Commissioner, this is Ben Stagg. Yes, Ben. Um, I understand what the motion is, but the applicant did ask to modify the request for an additional 150 feet inch box feet. So I just want to remind the commissioners that they did ask for that. Uh, is, is, that, is, that, is that different than what I'm looking at on the screen yeah. right now? Yes, I have a drawing that would reflect uh, what they just asked for. You okay, <laughs> can, you put, can you put the drawing up? Yep. So that, Let's go, show the next slide, Mike. I want, to, I want to make sure Mr. Mayo sees and what he sees. And next one, keep going. Keep going. One more. Okay, so this, so this is the drawing, and I'll explain this so you understand it. So based on what they just asked for, the box at the top slide, the top drawing with the four icons is the area of the most recent revision in September. If you add 150 feet to that box, that would be the smaller rectangle to the south. Those distances show the distance offshore, and the reason for those is there is SAV along this shoreline, 
with the bottom drawing. I could not combine these together because a mapping system is two different maps, but I put distances on the SAV map that are generally in the same location as the three distances on the aerial map. And you can see that the box, if they extend in another 150 feet inshore, would still be offshore of all of the current SAV bed. Now that's 2018. I did look at the composite, 2014 through 18 plus 2019. And 2018 is the year that SAV extended the farthest offshore of any of those years. So this is the worst case or best case scenario for SAV. And this box would clear, would not encroach into any of that shown SAV bed or any of the last five running years. So I believe, and you may want to ask the applicant, if this represents, I believe, what they just requested, which was an additional 150 feet inshore. If you wish to consider this, this would obviously change the footprint. And if you want to know what that is, I've calculated that as well. This would be a 500 by 110 foot area um, based on those coordinates, which would be about 10.44 acres, which would be 455,000 square feet, which would result in a royalty if approved in this configuration of $2,275 annually at a half a cent per square foot. And I'd be happy for the applicant to clarify if this matches what they're requesting. Well, I want to make sure before you ask the applicant, since this has come in now and I thought things are running down the track smoothly, which doesn't mean they aren't, this does not in any way, and I, I think the, uh, the answer is pretty, this does not in any way impede or come close to impeding the navigation that the protestant was concerned about. Is that correct? I believe that to be correct because this is even shallower here than this additional area, and it's still considerably 250 feet plus west of the Mill Creek Channel, and none of this is in the deeper area of Cherry Stone Creek. And furthermore, it avoids, uh, to the best extent practicable, the SAV, correct? That is correct. Okay. Well, this is from a parliamentary procedure, a little challenging, but I'll go and I'll try to do the best and block if I get off, let me know, because we do have a motion. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that this motion that's on the table is, is an acceptable motion at this time, unless we go back to it. The bottom line is, Ms. Husky, in looking at what has been now presented to us uh, in the last 15 minutes, um, is this what, does this actually represent what you're asking for? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Commissioner. We uh, we applaud um, Mr. Stagg's effort to put that last minute slide together. We apologize for, for adding this on so quickly this morning, but but it does very much, it very accurately describes what we're asking for, and we thank you again. You're most welcome. Mr. Mayo, the question is now in your corner looking at this. Uh, and I don't know if your clients are with you, but does, is this satisfactory to your clients at this juncture? Uh, Mr. Commissioner, we, um, in the modern world of technology, I had a text message with a thumbs up. So uh, we have no objection to the additional 150 um, shoreward feet. I think our, in fact, I've got a line drawing diagram showing the navigation around the north edge of the original box. So we are not affected adversely. Or the interests we are concerned about are not affected adversely. So we have no objection to it. Boy, I like it when a plan comes together. At this time, I'm gonna call the roll. Mr. France. Um, I, I, whoa, 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 I have a, I have a question here. Whoa, okay. Here. All right, well, all right, wait a, whoa, whoa, okay. <laughs> all right. All right, we, we have a motion to accept staff recommendations. So now I'm asking staff, what is their recommendation? You know, we, we, we know what the applicants asked for. We know that the protestant says that's okay. okay. We have not heard the staff has changed their recommendation. Right, um, Commissioner Bum, if, if I could real quick, I think, I, I don't remember who made the motion, but I, I think whoever made the motion was going based on what we understood the recommendation to B uh, at the time, which I don't think included this. Okay, well then let's start over again. This would be item number 10. 
Ballard. Mr. Commissioner uh, John Ziegler, I made that motion, but I think what we need to do is hear what staff recommendation that's, is. That's what I'm going to do, sir, as, as I write out this sheet one more time since I had to throw the other one away. Okay. I'll, I'll, I will call on the, the, the appropriate person in just a second. Now, Mr. Stagg, yes, you, have, you have presented to us modified maps of, uh, I guess, uh, third or fourth generation that uh, resulted from an application by Ballard Brothers Fish and Oyster Company Incorporated pertaining to uh, cages within Cherry Stone Creek in Northampton County. The, since we're going through this virtually, I'm going, to I'm going to refer to the picture that's currently up on the screen at the time of, I have 3.22 p.m. on October 27, 2020, which uh, depicts two pictures. One, which is obviously an aerial uh, that uh, has cages on it with numbers 412, 462, and 475 listed thereon. The picture to the bottom says SAV 2018 with three lines marked in yellow, top and bottom with red at 380 feet, 460 feet, and 445 feet with the number at the bottom VMRC 2020-0141. It's about the best I can describe the exhibit that we have in front of us without initialing my uh, computer screen. I'm asking you at this point, is this staff's recommendation pursuant to the application that has been presented to the commission? Uh, I'd like to say yes quickly, but I do want to explain how we got here. So staff's original recommendation was the previous slide that showed just this larger box at the top screen that you see now, because at the time, that was all we were dealing with. Uh, this offer, this not offer, but request, to add 150 feet while I was aware of it was not officially presented to the commission yet. So I made this drawing knowing that the applicant was going to probably request this at the hearing. So this represents what they have requested. And you're right, there's two drawings here. The distances show the distance offshore to the expanded 150 foot request. And the second drawing just shows the distance to the SAV showing that this box does not encroach into the SAV. To answer your question, staff is comfortable with still recommending approval of this expanded area with the increased square footage and the amended royalty amount that I quoted earlier of $2,275 annually based on 455,000 square feet, provided the applicant provides us with a new revised modified drawing, similar to the plan drawings you saw previously, that reflects this alignment, and we, we would recommend approval. Dr. Neal, does that adequately uh, satisfy the question that you proffered, or would you like further? Yes, yeah, so, so the first time I hear staff recommends approval of that extra line, that extra little rectangle. Yes, sir. Yes, that, that modifies staff's recommendation. Yes, sir. Zedron here. Mr. Zedron. Uh, so my motion now is that, uh, to clarify my motion, is that uh, I uh, hereby uh, uh, move to approve staff's amended recommendation in accordance with the uh, uh, picture that we're seeing right here. All right, sir. Is there a second to that motion? Christy Everett was second. Thank you, Ms. Everett. Yeah. Further comments, questions? I'll call the roll. Mr. France? Mr. Tankard? Aye. Uh, 
Mr. Zedrin? Aye. Dr. Neal? Aye. Mr. Miner? Mr. Miner? Ms. Lusk? Aye. Ms. Everett? Aye. Right. Chair votes aye. Recalling Mr. Miner. Does staff have him on the line still or any report? I am not seeing Mr. Miner on the line. All right. Motion passes one, two, three, four, five, six. Six yeas and three absent. Motion passes. Thank you all very much. Greatly appreciate it. Mr. Mayo, it's good to have you before the commission. You're always welcome. Have a great day, sir. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Next item on the agenda is public hearing, or not public hearing, public comments. Same thing, but not quite different. This is an opportunity for anyone in the audience that wishes to be heard on matters that are not on the agenda. Present time, if staff would open up the mic to see if anybody wishes to be heard. I see something in the chat block. Okay. Anyone wish to be heard on public comments? If not, we will be going to item number 12, public hearing, proposal to amend chapter four BAC 20-270-10, pertaining to the blue crab fishery to extend the season for hard crab pot fishery through December 9th, 2020. Mr. Gear, is it you? That's gonna be Alexa. Alexa, Alexa, good afternoon. What'd you do? Give the boss the day off? <laughs> he comes up next. We're still making him work. Oh, okay. All right. Go ahead. Proceed, please, ma'am. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioner and members of the Commission. This is a public hearing on a proposal to amend Chapter 4 VAC 20-270 pertaining to blue crab fishery to extend the season for the hard crab pot fishery through December 19th, 2020. Next slide, please. At the May 21st Crab Management Advisory Committee meeting, staff recommended status quo measures based on the results of the winter dredge survey, which had a decrease in crab abundance, mostly in the juvenile population, but a low harvest rate. CMAC voted unanimously to recommend status quo with the option to revisit that recommendation in the fall once effects of COVID on the fishery could be ascertained. On June 23rd, the commission voted to approve those status quo measures for 2020 and 2021. On October 5th, CMAC met again and voted unanimously to recommend extending the season through December 19th at, eight, at the April to November bushel limit rather than the lower March bushel limit. Next slide, please. The reasoning for CMAC's request is the effect of COVID-19 on the blue crab market and harvesters. Some crabbers did report not being able to sell crabs once the restaurants were ordered closed. However, even this late in the year, it's difficult to determine if COVID-19 actually affected harvest. This table shows preliminary harvest for 2019 and 2020 as reported to the VMRC by the end of September in each year. You can see the preliminary harvest in March 2020 is double that of March 2019, but April 2020 is less than half that in 2019. However, reporting does play a key role in this. 220 to 330 licensees have not reported so far in each month of 2020. This is 100 to 150 fewer licensees reporting than had reported by this time last year. Next slide. Since 2009, the crab pot season has only extended into December three times, until December 15th in 2012 and 2013, and December 20th in 2016. 
CMAQ's recommendation was to match the 2016 closure date of December 20th. However, December 20th of this year is a Sunday when crab potting is not allowed. So the committee recommended December 19th instead. Next slide. From these three years of December harvest, we have some idea of what a December season could look like. The graph on the left shows how many harvesters were active in each month from 2012 to 2018. Every November, whether there was a December season or not, had 200 to 300 active crab potters. In 2012, 2013, and 2016, fewer than 75 crabbers were active. The graph on the right shows how average daily harvest decreases in November and December. In each year, there is less harvest in late November than in early November, and harvest in December is even less than that. Next slide. So in December uh, of those three years, the daily number of trips was an average of 14 trips per day, and in the highest year, an average of 20 trips per day. The daily harvest from 2012, 2013, and 2016 was around 5,000 pounds per day. And in the highest year, 2012, it was around 9,200 pounds per day. So if we take those average daily harvests over the 19 days proposed for 2020, using the average, we could estimate 95,000 pounds of harvest, which is about 0.35% of 2019's harvest. And if we use the highest year, December this 2020 could harvest up to 175,000 pounds, which would be 0.65% of a 2019 harvest. Next slide. Now to go through the regulation uh, 270. In section 30, subsection C, we just add December to the lawful time period, daily time period. Next slide. In section 40, we amend the season limits. Uh, section A has the time the season may be open, the lawful season, and section subsection C lists the dates within which hard crab pots cannot be placed in the tidal waters of Virginia. Next slide. In section 51, we amend the date within which uh, daily bushel limits are active. So as mentioned earlier, the December bushel limits would match the April through November bushel limits rather than the lower March bushel limits. Next slide. In section 55, we extend the season for um, size limits for peeler crabs. Next slide. Staff recommends amending chapter 4 VAC 20 270 pertaining to blue crab fishery. I'm sorry. To to amend that, to extend the season for the hard crab pot fishery through December 19th, 2020. Uh, I will mention this, this recommendation only extends the season for hard crab pots. Peeler pots and other, all other crabbing gears will be held to their currently established closure dates. In July, the commission sets the seasons for 20, the commission set the seasons for 2020 and 2021. This change only affects the 2020 season. The 2021 season will still be in regulation as ending November 30th, so this will be reviewed as usual in July 2021. At this time, staff has received no public comments outside those made at the CMAC meeting. And one comment of note at this meeting was from Ron Lipschitz of VIMS and the Winter Dredge Survey, who stated that extending the season this year was reasonable given the low daily harvest rates in December and that the 2020 survey showed adult crabs to still be above average abundance. And I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions for Alexa? I guess I have one, Alexa. Um, 
We're extending the crab season to a Saturday. Are they planning on getting their pots up the same day on Saturday that they fished the last day? Or is that pot going to be overboard on a Sunday, which is normally not a traditional day, which is also a prohibited day for commercial crabbing? And when are they planning on getting the pots out of the water? The pups will have to be out of the water um, on that Saturday because we'll be have to be taken out of the water at latest that Saturday because okay. the um, amended subsection C says it shall be unlawful to leave, uh, place, set, fish, or leave any commercial gear in that time. I thought so, but it went by kind of fast. I thought I caught that in yellow, but I just wanted to make sure. So, well. Um, here, here's the, the only thing I'll say is I don't mean to sound tyrannical or whatever, but we're extending the season and I've gotten a lot of positive feedback from it. And Dr. Lipschitz thinks it's a good idea. Um, I would expect law enforcement not to be very, very lenient come the middle of that following week. Those crab pots are overboard. Um, and I don't know how we get that word out, but we've, we've, we're holding our word and being reasonable and and scientifically reasonable in, in what we're doing but i don't expect a whole lot of ghost pots in the water at christmas time that that's that's not going to work and just it, it just can't happen because if it does uh if i'm around i'm not as likely to be um as understanding and reasonable as i am this year and i i mean that only from a resource protection perspective, and that's all. That's that's all it comes from. So, I don't know how we get the word out, but that's that's going to be a hard and fast day right there. And while we've normally been very very reasonable as far as you know, working on Sundays to get crab pots out during storms and things like that, this one here is one that um, comes with some some responsibility on the crabbers' parts to make sure they do make sure they definitely do the right thing. So that's the end of my sermons for the day, I can assure you. So anyone else have any comments? Questions of Alexa? This is a public hearing. Is anyone in the audience in favor or against this issue? If not, the chair will entertain a motion. James, man, I, approve, I move that we approve staff recommendation. Motion made by Mr. Miner to approve. Is there a second? So, so moved, Ed Tankard. Mr. Tankard, thank you, sir. Mr. France, back with us. Mr. Tankard. Aye. Mr. Zedrin. Aye. Dr. Neal. Aye. Mr. Miner? Aye. Ms. Lusk? Aye. Ms. Everett? Ms. Everett? Sorry, I'm not meeting. Aye. That's okay. I know how long the day has been. Motion passes. Thank you very much. At this time, we have Mr. Pat Gear who wants to give us a very brief conference call with my boss here in about 20 minutes. One down. I, one knew, one. Uh, I knew that was coming to be very well, brief. Thank you, Commissioner. Look, look thank I, you, Commissioner. I, I didn't set the schedule on that one, believe me. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, Everybody sir. Can you hear me? All right. Yeah. Well, thank you, Commissioner and um, um, Associate Commissioners. Uh, I'm going to make this very brief, and we're, um, we've had a very light agenda in fisheries on, in the commission meetings recently, and I just want to let you know that's going to be picking up a little bit. We have um, coming up in December. Uh, we're going to have a, a public hearing on an action to reduce recreational cobia harvest by 40% for the 2021 through the 2023 fishing seasons. And this is due to a payback of overage uh, Virginia has for, um, we've had an overage uh, for recent years that from 2017 through 2019. This is a part of Amendment 1 of ASMOC's cobia fisheries manager plan that develops harvest specifications each year. And the state is awarded a portion of that harvest. Our annual recreational quota is 39.4% of the total coastwide recreational quota, or 29,039 fish annually. Now, we've gone over that. Our average for the last three years has been 50,000, 
154 fish. So that's the reason for the 40% uh, reduction we have to come up with. Um, we met with our Fin Fish Management Advisory Committee on October 14th, took to them a lot of options and asked them to whittle it down to a, a reasonable amount. And they did that. They came up with five options that um, include a series of season and or vessel limit, re limit reductions. We're taking that out for uh, public comment. We have a survey online that people can answer. Um, and at the commission meeting in um, December, we'll have uh, FMAX comments, staff recommendations, and the results of those public comments for um, at the December meeting to vote on for final approval. The second item we have is uh, concerning Menhaden. Now that the commission has administrative authority for Menhaden, uh, we need to adjust regulations on a regular basis to account for changing harvest specifications, just like we do for black sea bass and summer flounder. At last week's ASMFC meeting, the Menhaden board adopted a new total allowable catch um, for the 2021-2022 season of 194,400 metric tons. That represents a 10% reduction of the previous uh, TAC. The decrease was not because of concerns with the status of the stock, but more to incorporate ecological reference points, which have been included in the management scheme to account for manage, uh, Menhaden's importance as a food source for apex predators such as striped bass. Uh, Virginia's TAC will, uh, will remain at 78.66%, roughly 151,392 metric tons. We'll meet with our Menhaden Manager and Advisory Committee either in no November or December. And the proposed changes will come before the commission in probably December. We're hoping December may have to be pushed until January. And finally, on to um, Kirker and Spot. The recreational commercial harvest of both these species has been down in recent years. ASMSC manages these species through um, what's called a traffic light analysis, or TLA, which has uh, trigger designations when um, which look at specific management actions when those triggers are exceeded. Those triggers have been exceeded for Croker for the last six years and for Spot for uh, two of the last three years. So we have to take action, and those actions are going to um, start in 2021. Um, and it will be establishing recreational possession limit for each species not to exceed 50 fish per day and a reduction in the commercial harvest of at least 1%. We can be more con um, conservative if we want to, but that's the minimum we have to do. Staff will meet with the um, the FMAC and its spot crooker work group to develop the management actions. We have to develop regulations. We don't have any regulations on these species at this point, and this will come before the commission in early April. And finally, I just want to acknowledge the staff, the hard work they've been doing, working remotely, getting everything done. And in addition, the work they've been doing on the disaster relief applications and the, for the CARES Act. Um, we've been going through this. Uh, um, Deputy Commissioner Bolin mentioned it last month, and. Our application period is open, and we've received over 500 applications so far, which is about 25% of the folks that are uh, qualified in round one. The application period is set to close this Friday, and we're hoping we get a flood of applications and uh, online applications mail in before the deadline. And um, that's about all I have. I just wanted to go through that quickly, and if there's any questions, I'll take them at this time. Any questions for Mr. Gear? Well, I just want to remind you that our next commission meeting is on December the 8th. Uh, I won't be talking with you over Thanksgiving. I hope you all have a, a safe and happy holiday and stay safe as well. Um, I just thank you for your dedication, your hard work, and your support. Uh, we'll try to do the best we possibly can. And a lot of times there's some moving targets involved, and uh, I've got a great staff that does a great job putting on what you saw today. Um, normally, when we're in a commission meeting room, uh, you know how many people are involved in today. Really, uh, I think we had a total of three running this whole program. So uh, I got a good team there, and I really appreciate their hard work. So with that, uh, I bid you adieu and, uh, and, and, and wish, wish you uh, uh, a happy Thanksgiving when it comes, as they say in Jamaica. And also, if you need me, do not hesitate to call. God bless. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thank you. You too.